China is ramping up aggressive behavior against U.S. aircraft, and President Joe Biden prepares to visit Israel. All that and more today, October 18th, 2023. Good morning, early birds. I'm Zimone Perez, and this is the Early Bird Brief, produced by Defense News and Military Times. First up, we have some news coming out of the Indo-Pacific. The Pentagon released more than a dozen previously classified photos and videos of what officials called coercive and high-risk interactions with Chinese fighter jets. The images and videos have been taken since early 2022. The Defense Department is concerned these interactions could lead to accidents that spark conflict between the U.S. and China. The release is a subset of about 180 similar interactions with Chinese fighters since fall 2021. Eli Ratner is the Pentagon's top civilian on China and Indo-Pacific issues. He told reporters this is a sharp increase in interactions. Well, last year's CMPR noted that the P- that PLA fighter jets were increasingly engaging in coercive and risky operational behavior. This year's CMPR provides a much clearer estimate of that disturbing trend. Specifically, since the fall of 2021, we have seen more than 180 such incidents, more in the past two years than in the decade before that. That's nearly 200 cases where PLA operators have performed reckless maneuvers or discharged chaff or shot off flares or approached too rapidly or too close to U.S. aircraft. The Washington Post was first to report on the material's release. The incidents are labeled as, quote, coercive and high risk, rather than more frequently used terms like unsafe and unprofessional. Ratner declined to list the criteria that separate the two classifications. Navy Admiral John Aquilino, who leads Indo-Pacific Command, said the Defense Department believes these confrontations are part of a larger strategy on the part of the Chinese military. When you get to unsafe and unprofessional, that's, that's really concerning behavior, right? People's lives are at risk. What we've seen since 2001 is a set of actions that have brought airplanes much closer together than are comfortable for those in the cockpit. Uh, In other words, flying off uh, my wing at 15 feet for 45 minutes has too much of a chance to lead to an accident. We've seen an increase in those close intercepts and activities in very close proximity to our airplanes since the fall of 2001. A subset of those 180 have been unsafe, unprofessional. Ratner said Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has spoken privately with his Chinese counterparts about the interactions when he's had the opportunity. Another important story, Ukraine has already started using long-range ballistic missiles provided by the United States on the battlefield against Russia. U.S. officials said it quietly delivered the missiles that Ukraine said it urgently needed and that President Joe Biden promised last month. The U.S. officials were not authorized to publicly discuss the matter before an official announcement and spoke on the condition of anonymity. One of the officials said the missiles arrived in Ukraine within the last few days. Here's why it matters. The delivery of the Army tactical missile system, known as ATACMS, to the warfront gives Ukraine a critical ability to strike Russian targets that are farther away. Because of lingering U.S. concerns about escalating tensions with Russia, the ATACMS version that went to Ukraine will have a shorter range than the maximum distance the missiles can have. Some versions of the missiles can go as far as about 180 miles, but again, the ones sent to Ukraine have a far shorter range and carry cluster munitions. When fired, the cluster munitions open in the air and release hundreds of bomblets rather than a single warhead. The U.S., however, has refused to provide any details on how many missiles would be delivered. Officials have suggested that the plan was to send a small number, roughly two dozen. Meanwhile, Voice of America reported that all 31 U.S.-made M1A1 Abrams tanks the Biden administration promised Kyiv have arrived in the country. In other news, a Defense Department Inspector General report found that improper storage damaged $1.8 billion in Army ground combat equipment. For more on this, Military Times editorial fellow Jaime Morcarillo joins the episode today. So Jaime, what is this agency within the Defense Department at the center of this report? It's called the Defense Logistics Agency, correct? So the Defense Logistics Agency is one of those very important Department of Defense sub-agencies that no one's really ever heard of. 
it's tasked with managing the military's behemoth supply chains um, from acquisition, to transportation, to storage, to deployment. Um, VLA's distribution division is responsible for storing and disseminating material. Um, and as of last summer, the DLA distribution um, division handled a total of $3.87 billion of uh, Army ground combat gear. And what did the report find about their storing of Army ground combat munitions? So investigators visited two DLA distribution centers that held around $1.96 billion in Army ground warfare equipment. And they found that $1.8 billion worth of this equipment, around 92% of it, was crumbling or at increased risk of um, deterioration because it was stored improperly. And they found that two thirds of the inspected parts valued at around $1.3 billion exhibited critical deficiencies, which means that they were, you know, like actively deteriorating or and in like immediate danger of moving down to a lower condition code, which is a measure of a piece of, of an equipment's utility. And they found, which seemed to be pretty glaring lapses in common sense. For example, at one location, they found 80 gas turbines worth around $90 million just stacked together on a lawn outside a warehouse, even though regulations for that equipment clearly stated that they were meant to be stored inside. In other cases, they found tens of millions of dollars worth of tank tracks, vehicle transmission assemblies, and diesel engines all stashed away and, you know, exposed to the elements without proper packaging. Of course, I'm sure there's the price tag element. Why does this all matter? Yeah, so, I mean, the report itself on its face seems a bit mundane, but investigators stressed that these shortfalls could really, one, endanger personnel uh, that work at these distribution centers. Um, It could waste millions of dollars. Um, It can also undermine readiness, you know, at a time when the army and other branches of the military are attempting to retool their logistical capabilities to prepare for conflict across multiple theaters. They pointed out that letting these, this equipment go to waste or deteriorate needlessly really could flush tens of millions of dollars down the drain. Um, And it could also, you know, compromise the readiness of some of the core components of the Army's ground combat capabilities. Some of the equipment stored at these facilities were spare parts for some flagship, you know, land fighting technology like the Bradley Fighting Vehicle, the Striker Armored Combat Vehicle, um, and, and the Abrams tank. Thanks, Jaime. For more conversations like this one, please like and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. Also on the radar for today, President Joe Biden is expected to travel to Israel today. Biden's trip comes as concerns increase that the Israel-Hamas war could expand into a larger regional conflict. Earlier this week, Reuters reported that Army General Michael Eric Carilla, the head of the U.S. Central Command, also made a trip to Israel. And the aircraft carrier Gerald R. Ford and its strike group will remain deployed in the Mediterranean longer than expected. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin approved the extension yesterday. The Ford Carrier Strike Group arrived in the eastern Mediterranean last week, and Austin directed it to head to the region after an attack by Hamas and retaliatory strikes by Israel. The aircraft carrier Dwight D. Eisenhower and its strike group are also heading to the region, and the Pentagon confirmed about 2,000 American troops are ready to deploy, though a Pentagon spokesperson said Austin has not yet decided whether those forces will deploy. Air Force F-16s, F-15s, and A-10 fighter aircraft were also sent to the region. And now here's some other stories that we're hearing chirps about. House Republicans rejected Ohio Representative Jim Jordan for House Speaker on the first ballot. Jordan, or any nominee, needs 217 votes to secure the gavel. The House has been without a speaker and effectively at a standstill since it ousted Kevin McCarthy. Stars and Stripes reported a B-52H Stratofortress will make a rare landing on the Korean Peninsula this week to show a, quote, ironclad commitment to the U.S.-South Korea alliance. The Coast Guard said this week it has launched a formal investigation into a fatal accident off the coast of Maine. The main mast of the vessel fell, killing one person and injuring three others. And this week, United Nations peacekeepers started departing from two bases in northern Mali, 
It's part of a forced withdrawal from the country amid increasing insecurity and a rise in attacks by Islamic extremists. And on this day in history, in 1867, the U.S. formally takes possession of Alaska after purchasing the Russian territory. Alaska is now home to military installations like Fort Wainwright and Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson. That's it for us this morning. To get more top stories and breaking news, go to defensenews.com slash ebb to subscribe to the Early Bird Brief newsletter. Please give us a like, rating, and a comment wherever you get your podcasts, and be sure to follow us on social media at defense underscore news and at military times. The Early Bird Brief is hosted and produced by me, Zimone Z. Perez. Today's episode features stories by Megan Myers, the Associated Press, Jaime Morcurio, and Diana Stancy. Our editor-in-chief is Mike Bruce. Have a great day.